I'd like to welcome you once again to Faith Reformed Baptist Church. We will continue our study in the book of Romans chapter 9. I would like to read once again verses 4 and 5. I'll be reading from the King James Scriptures. And when I say the King James Scriptures, there's only the Scriptures of the Lord. It's just a King James translation. And many times when it says hath, I may say has. And if it says ye, I may say you. And so I will be translating the King James into English. That's just my way. Thank you. <clears throat> Verse number four. Who are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Please allow me a brief time of prayer before we begin. Holy Father, please help us. Holy Spirit, please be with my heart and be with the hearts of those who hear your word. We pray, Lord, that the purposes of your word will be made clear and that we might grasp the truth, that it might guide us, that we might live our lives to your glory. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. Amen. This is going to be a very difficult lesson. Many times uh, you'll, you may feel confused. So I want you to follow this one simple principle. Very few people are not confused. In fact, everyone is confused. It's just that some people are confused at a much higher level than you. And so I want you to feel comfortable in knowing that your life is a pilgrimage that you are on your way and that you learn as you go. And so do not be discouraged. But I want you to take what you can. Remember, a banquet has many things to eat. You don't have to eat it all. Eat what is there for you to take. And if it looks good, try it. And I suggest that you take a little bit of everything. Remember that this particular passage of scripture was described by a theologian, Martin Lloyd-Jones, as a theodicy. A theodicy is a, um, is it a defense of God's character in the presence of sin. And what is happening here is Paul's arguing <coughs> that he is anticipating a question where someone is going to question the integrity of God. And the question is unspoken. But it, it sounds a little bit like this in verse number 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. That presupposes that someone is saying, Hey, I don't think God kept his word to the Jews because it appears to me like they've rejected their Messiah. And so there is this challenge. There's also the idea later on in verse number 14, where it says, And what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? When it comes, uh, the question comes after Paul is describing the right that God has in election. And so this theodicy is Paul's response to a question about God's integrity, and he answers with Scripture and with the power of the Holy Spirit. But he begins the chapter, if you recall, with his heartfelt burden, his heaviness and continual sorrow for his brothers according to the flesh, which are his fellow Hebrews. Now, I want you to see how Paul describes it, and we've been spending much time on it. In verse number 4, he's saying, let me describe to you who my brethren are according to the flesh. Now, these are the ones who are Israelites. They are Israelites. Now remember, Jacob was the first one who had his name changed, the only one that actually had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. Israel. And the name Israel means prince with God and man. But when God spoke to Pharaoh through Moses, he said that my firstborn, Israel, let him go. Let him go to come to me and worship me in the wilderness. There is a relationship that God had with these physical people. 
And you're going to see that relationship. And there was the purpose behind it. God had given them an adoption of a nation. And as a matter of fact, we're going to go through every one of these words. Adoption, glory, covenant, giving of the law, service of God, which is going to be the bulk of this message, the service of God, and the promises. If you recall, I mentioned briefly that God had adopted among all the nations of the world this one people. And there's a reason behind it. There is a reason behind God choosing that one group of people. And the reason is this. In verse number 5, And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. God came in Christ to the world to save them. Because this was the, I'm going to call it a promise, but in many places, God calls it his covenant or his pledge. His pledge and his agreement with himself. The fact that he made an oath, he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself that he would come and he would send his promised seed. This started at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 when he said that he would send a seed and it would contend with the seed of Satan and that he would bruise his head even though he would bruise his heel. And so from the very beginning we have God promising to send a deliverer. Now that is why God adopted this nation to achieve that end. Now he also said concerning the glory. There is a glory that God gave this one nation that no other nation had. All the nations that were in the land of Canaan, when God brought his people out of uh, Egypt, they already heard of all the exploits that God did in Egypt. They knew God's people were coming. They had plenty of opportunity to leave. They said, these are the people that God came and turned the, the rivers into blood. He slew the Pharaoh's firstborn and the firstborn of all the world. All the plagues. The world knew that. And in the wilderness, God followed them or led them. He led them with a pillar of cloud and a fire by night. The glory of God was shown through all the earth because God chose to reveal himself to these people and to have a pathway to bring God into this world in Jesus Christ to save his people. And next was the covenants. And we covered that last week. And we talked how God has one real covenant, even though he says the covenants, plural, and the promises. Because in the renewing of this covenant, God goes to an individual and says, this is how my covenant pertains to you, Noah. I'm going to destroy the world because there's wickedness everywhere. But I will preserve you and you, out of you, will come the deliverer. And then next we go to Abraham. He chose Abraham and said, here is a friend of mine. He trusts me, and he said, I will make of you many nations, and all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. And that was even more information, more information about how Christ would be coming into the world. And this covenant was passed down from generation to generation, and in particular, it passed down to Isaac, the son that was promised, and then to Jacob, the one who wrestled for the blessing. And then after that, we have the giving of the law, where the mantle, shall we call it, for lack of a better word, the covenant was renewed once again with Moses, as we read in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 2. And so with Moses, we have even more information, a lot more information. As a matter of fact, the information is so great that God gave his moral law in tablets of stone and the ceremonial law depicting the gospel of Christ in the events that in the in the service of God and that's where both, most of this message will be on the service of God will be depicted showing Christ as the savior 
And then there are other laws concerning the, the, uh, the Hebrew economy as a nation. All these things were given to say, these are my people by whom the Christ is going to come. And then we have the service of God mentioned. Now, I'll spend just a few seconds here. We'll get to it in more length later on. But usually when you go to a church, they say, well, when do your services start? That's where this term comes from. The church has a service. It really can be, you can use this word worship in its place. When do you begin your worship? Because the service that is depicted in the uh, Old Testament is the way that God said, this is how I want you to worship me. It is not as though God has said, worship me any way you like, as long as you're sincere. He's never said that. He said, I want to be worshipped sincerely in Jesus Christ. And he has shown us the pattern in the ceremonial law. It is regulated. It is regulated. Our worship of God is regulated by the Word of God. We learn how God wants to be worshipped. It is our service. And Paul is saying, I, I have a heart that is broken for my physical brethren. Because to them were given the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service, and the promises. Now, before I go on to the service, I want to mention one thing that I, I don't think I, fa I failed to cover sufficiently last week. And that is in the giving of the law. When it comes to the service of God, we must have a law. God gave the law that we might serve him. And so in the giving of the law, I believe that when, when, when Paul was describing, he didn't say, and we who have the law. Did you notice he didn't say that? He said, in the giving of the law. And so I would like to choose a passage of scripture that describes that process. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 32. Ask now of the days that are past, which are before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from one side of heaven unto the other whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is or hath been heard like it. Now he's saying this, I want you to go find anyone you want, whether they be in China, whether they be in Russia, whether they be in the farthest islands of the sea, no matter where you go, go to the farthest point and all I want you to do is ask anyone, anywhere, this, has anyone ever seen me do to you, you know what I have done to you. Has there ever been ever a God me speak to people? He says, Did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard me and live? This is an unprecedented thing. No one anywhere has ever had God reveal himself the way I have revealed myself to you. And he's talking to Israel. Now, I want you to consider this in a few minutes. Paul in Romans chapter 9 is going to identify who Israel really is. The physical Israel are the ones to whom God gave the law and the ceremonial law and the method and the means and the pattern that we were to learn the gospel by. And this is unique. This is a path that God created from the beginning. This is not a plan A or B or C. God has always planned to reveal himself through the Jew. Remember what the Lord Jesus said to the woman at the well in Samaria. Salvation is of the Jew. And what he meant is that I am here and I am the Jew that was promised from the very beginning to deliver. You are seeking the Messiah. I am he. That's what he said. The salvation is of the Jew. And God is saying to whom you, who, whoever you go to, ask them, have you ever heard of anyone that said, God spoke to me? Now, I know there are going to be churches in town that say, yeah, God speaks to us all the time. I'm telling you that this says that this has not happened. This is where God has spoken to them. When Moses saw that bush burning, he said, why is that bush burning and not being consumed? And when he went there, God spoke to him. 
It has not happened like that anywhere. It is a unique experience, the giving of the law. The giving of the law, God has not given the law like that to anyone except Israel. That's it. Israel. But to Israel, God was known throughout the whole earth. Everyone knew about God, about the God of Israel. Number 34. Or hath God essayed to go and to take him a nation out of the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm? He went into Egypt, a nation, and pulled out his own nation with a mighty hand. He's never done it anywhere else before. And everyone knew about it. This was not a secret. This was famed throughout the whole world. The people in the land of Canaan were quaking in their boots, even though they did not have the guts to go in. They were still quaking in their boots. Great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did in Egypt before your eyes, unto you it was showed that thou, that you, might know that the Lord, he is God, and there is none else beside him. Now this is unique. This is something that has never happened in all the world, in all the history. Now, you may say, well, are you sure? Absolutely, I'm sure. That's what it says. Remember the time when Paul went to Athens to preach the gospel? And he went into Mars Hill, and he saw this one idol. Or not, it was a shrine dedicated to the unknown God. And Paul said, you know what? I'm going to tell you about the unknown God. You happily feel after him. That's what he says. You, with your own blindness, reach out and try to touch and try to feel. You have never seen him. You have never heard him. You don't know if he's there or not. But there is a revelation of God. God has spoken in his book. He has given his word. And he has said, worship me this way. It is not a mistake. It is not something that we make up. It is not something that we go out and try to feel after God and say, I will worship him in this way. It's sincere, but I'm going to do it in, in a way that is true to me. God says, don't do that. You are feeling after your own. You are reaching out like a groping blind man. And so, the giving of the law is a tremendous, tremendous thing. Number one, it revealed the moral black and white of sin. Now, <clears throat> the most interesting thing that we have today is the misunderstanding of the gospel in how some people will say, you know, the law has been done away with. Because, you know, when the gospel came, God did away with the law. Well, there's a lot of confusion going on, very much confusion, because God truly did do away with the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law is concluded and, and done. That's going to be the bulk of this message when we get to Hebrews chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. I won't read them all, but we have lots to say about the ceremonial law. But I want you to understand that when God revealed himself, he revealed who he was morally. And that is a tremendous blessing for all the earth. I'll put it like this. Men listen to the moral aspects of the law, and sometimes it doesn't click with them. It attacks them, it convicts them, and therefore they try to avoid it. I want you to imagine a person. I'm going to give you an example. I am partially, you know, a lot, colorblind. I cannot see a lot of the things, the way colors blend together and so on. And sometimes I just depend on the good taste of others when it comes to the color blending and so on. But I think it would be a better example. But I'm just telling you that there are certain things that we cannot do physically. Some people cannot hear good tone when it comes to music. And uh, they, they love to hear music and somehow uh, music that's off key, they say, yeah, that's just as good as this music, you know. And so uh, you really need to have a tone or an ear that can hear the music. Now, I want you to imagine a man 
that has never been able to tell the difference between off key and on key. And then all of a sudden, God changed his ears. And all of a sudden, he hear, begins to hear the beautiful tones of music. And then he, I would imagine he would start to appreciate the beauty of music. In man's heart, we do not see the beauty of God's justice and his righteousness. And when God quickens a man's heart, he tunes his heart. He tunes it. And then all of a sudden, what used to be awful to our ears and convicting to us now becomes something of beauty to him. Something that actually says, ah, oh, that sounds beautiful. Now put the music away. I want you to think of what is beautiful. What is beautiful to your eyes. Some people will look at a building that's really well constructed, well designed, and say, you know, that's a thing of beauty. When it comes to God, who cannot be seen, who is everywhere, that we are not to have any type of image in our hearts and minds, and yet we are to see his beauty, we are to know his beauty and what that is, it is the beauty of virtue, the beauty of holiness, the beauty of righteousness and justice. And when God tunes a man's heart, then the law that is revealed becomes precious. All of a sudden, there is a symphony when he sees justice. There is rejoicing when he sees righteousness. And when he sees sin, there is discord and evil and is disgusting. And we fight against it. In the law, in our service to God, I can, I can see right now that I'm going to have to have another message on this. But in our service to God, we must see the beauty of his person. We must see the beauty of the law. Because the lesson this morning we had in Sunday school was excellent. Excellent. But there's also another aspect of the law that says, you know, the law is something that is to be exercised. I have seen my son and my daughters play musical instruments and I've never been able to, well, I've never played one, you know. Anyhow, I have some kids that love to play music. And when I watch them practice, I love to hear them practice. And many times they play wrong notes, many times they're off, many times the timing is not right. But when I hear them practice, I hear them get better. <clears throat> and you know what they practice? They practice scales. Up and down and up and down. I didn't know there were so many different scales. There seems to be a different scale for every note. And so, that's how you become good at music. You play the scales. Now, how many of you like to listen to beautiful music? Well, that is something, isn't it? But I'll tell you what, I cannot sit down and look at a sheet of music and pick up any instrument and make it sound good. However, that is the way a man is before the Holy Spirit changes his heart. But when it comes to knowing how to play a piece of music, that is different than a scale, is it not? But I'll tell you what, if you don't practice your scales, you can't play your music. And the law is like the scales. We must look at the law and practice and say, what does this law mean? Let me go over it in my mind. It is a beautiful thing. The stealing, the lying, hideous. The loving about, with all the heart. The loving the other as himself. The beauty of that, those are the scales. Now, people think, well, what good is it? I'm not going to sit there and play my scales. I'm not, we're not going to sit here and just say the Ten Commandments back and forth to each other. But unless you know your scales, unless you're able to play them well, when someone puts a sheet of music before you, you won't be able to play it. But if you know your scales, you can play it. And you know what our lives are like? Our lives, you wake up in the morning and God puts a sheet of music before you. It's called the day that you live. It's called today. And now you're going to play that song. Now if you've practiced your scales, you will be able to navigate through that day with the virtues that please God. And you will create a symphony of beauty to God and for His glory. Do you see how that works, where we become exercised in what is right, exercised in the law of God, and God has not shown it to anyone but his people? And I'm going to get to that later.
You see, well, he gave it to everyone. Everyone is tone deaf in this world. Everyone cannot appreciate the beauty of righteousness and goodness and justice. They only want what's good for themselves and they play their own music and it's horrible. It is confusion. It is selfishness. And it hurts my ears. It hurts the ears of my heart to see this whole world dance to the beat of their own music. And yet God has given us a heart that can hear the beauty of justice and righteousness. And we've been told to practice our scales because every day you will play before the Lord your heart. And when situations come up, how do you navigate it? Well, if you knew how to play the scales, you can go right through the music and it creates a beautiful sound. You didn't write the music, but you play the music. And you do not create the day that you live. God brings all these events into your life. God says, live this day to my glory. And because you have practiced the scales of the law, because you have practiced the beauty of listening to the beautiful notes and tones that come from virtue, that come from the beauty of what is right, then you live your life to the glory of God. And God is pleased. God is pleased with a people that brings glory to himself. That is the service. That is the nature of the service of God. Well, I'm going to get into the worship of God next week because I'm not quite done with this part yet. When it comes to putting away of the law, I'm going to say this. I'm going to give you the bottom line next week and then I'll go through all the whole thing again. The bottom line is this. There are parts of the law that we put away and you know why we put them away? Because they should not be in competition with our Lord. I'll, I'll say it again. When it comes to the law, we don't put that away. That is the beauty of his virtue, the beauty of his nature. But if I was to say, I want you to come into the presence of God by the virtues of Jesus Christ. This is how they did it in the Old Testament. You go and you go and look at the sanctuary. What do you see in the sanctuary? You see candlesticks. You see the showbread. Well, should we have that? Should we have that right here? Because God says, in my sanctuary, in my tabernacle, I want you to do it just the way Moses was told in the mountain. Candlesticks, bread. And when only one goes into the Holy of Holies, there's going to be an ark. Inside of that, there's going to be Aaron's rod that budded. There's going to be the tables of stone. And that is where the blood will be offered. Now, should we bring an animal and have one of us go in and offer an animal? No. No, we should not. Why? Because when we walk in this auditorium, do you know what I want to you, do you know what I want you to know about that our Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world and he is the bread of life he alone I'm not going to put something here to compete with him I'm not going to have some kind of someone I'm not going to have honor rate bake me a big old table of bread put it over here and have that compete with the bread that comes from heaven. Nor am I going to have some kind of big candelabra over here that we can come and, and have a big procession to light these candles. And, and have that compete with the brightness of our God who shows the truth to the world. And neither will I have some type of person sacrifice an animal and put blood on anything when the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ has been shed for our sins. I will not have that compete with that. You know why? Because the scriptures will tell us, and you'll see more of it next week. I'm going to lay it out for you next week. That these things have been, the scripture called annulled annulled. They have ceased. They have stopped. Many times Christians get confused. They say, I'm no longer under the law. The law is done away with. The law is stopped. The only laws that have stopped are the ones that Christ achieved for us. The other laws are the ones that he opens up to you to be in fellowship with. If a Christian ever wants to put away the virtues of the moral law. It's like saying, what have I to do with thee, God? Who are you that I should be happy in your presence? Or to hear the wonderful tones of your music, the beauty of your virtue.
and let me be prepared to play the song that you have for me today. Let my heart be prepared to play the symphony that he has prepared me. Whether it be difficulty, whether it be a sad song, or whether it be a happy song, whatever it is, we must navigate this day according to the light that he has put on our path, which is his law. The beauty of God's nature, the law of God. Oh, to love God with all your heart. People say, well, I'm going to try to love God with all your heart. If you don't know the beauty of his virtue, what are you loving? I'd like to know that. Just what in the world are you loving? Are you just trying to say, I'm going to picture a God in my heart and mind and just try to love him? No, don't do that. Learn about the one. Learn about his virtue. The goodness, the righteousness, the justice. He wants you to be outraged at injustice. He wants you to be thrilled with the exaltation of righteousness. He wants you to value your judgment in doing right. Think about the king that was honored among all the kings of the earth that said, you know what? That's Solomon. He is one good king. You know why? Because he's so rich. No, no. Because of his wisdom. Because of his wisdom. Do not let the world honor Christ because we get worldly rich. Do not let the world think that we're some kind of good because we drive big cars. But let the world honor God when he sees his people that they are virtuous. That they seek after what is right. Eschew what is wrong. And we live our lives playing the notes. <laughs> We've practiced the scales, right? You've thought about what is right and wrong. You've thought about what it means to truly be someone that would say ought against your neighbor to bear false witness or to harm him in any way or to malign them or to steal from them or to dishonor God. To dishonor God. There are so many things that we can talk about when it comes to the honoring of our God. And I'm going to give one example and then we're going to move on. I want to stop right here because I don't want to, I don't want to break this message up too much. But I'll say this. In the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments, half of it is honoring God, half of it is treating men right. And one of them is worship. God, uh, we'll put it this way. Some people like to say, I don't worship on Sundays because I'm not under the law. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Does God require us to worship at all? The answer is yes. He's given us rules on how to worship. Now I shall ask you, how many times? How many times do you need to worship God? Once? That should be enough, right? No. How often? Well, if, you have, if God says worship me, it's got to be more than once. How often? Does God tell us how often? God said, see everything around you? See the trees? See the universe? See every the air, the planet, all, you, everything. And everything from the very end to the very beginning. All of it. I have done this all in six days. I've done it all in six days. Now on the seventh day, I rested. I think that we should probably do what God says. You see, now that is an exaggeration when I said probably. Do not think that I mean probably. I'm saying that if God says, I want you to systematically worship me every six days on the seventh day, then that is a moral thing, because that is a moral thing to do, to worship God. We should worship him. Now, when it comes to other things in the moral law, how do you take his name in vain? Think about that. Think about taking the name of God and making it empty in its use. Think about that. Because if you practice those scales, then when the music is laid before you, you will play the tune right. When the opportunities that God brings you, you will then worship him when he should be worshipped. You will then honor him when he should be honored. And then when circumstances arise and you are required to deal 
with humans, <laughs> humans, <laughs> other people, in a righteous and upright manner, then because you know the scales, you'll say, I know what notes I need to play when this is presented to me. The note is here, I play that, comes down here. And believe me, there's a lot of practice that goes on. I, I like musicians, I like what they do, and watching them practice, my goodness, there's a lot of practice. That should be at the very least what a man does with the law of God. He needs to be exercised to discern right from wrong and then take the next breath, the next day, as the opportunity to play those notes, to present to God the symphony that God has written. The things that come into your life, they come to you by God. He expects you to react to them appropriately. If you react to them appropriately, that is how you glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Not just saying words in church. It's how you present and react to everything that God brings to your life. Nowhere has it ever been done or said like it's been done to Israel. And you may be saying, well, they're, they're, I'm not Israel. Don't be too quick. Do not be too quick to say that you are not Israel. Because when God chose his people, and I'm going to end with this, and then I'm going to take up the same topic next week. Same topic. <laughs> when God made a covenant, he said, I'm going to make a covenant, and I'm going to tell you about it, Adam and Eve. I'm sending a seed. Noah, I'm going to make sure that everything is destroyed, but you, one of your people, are going to be the bearer of the Messiah. And when he comes to Abraham, Abraham, and I want you to think of these things with just a simple words so you can remember them. Abraham was a friend of God. When you think of Abraham, think friend of God. Friend of God. His son Isaac. In Isaac shall thy name or shall thy seed be called. Remember how his brother, what was, and, and what was his brother's name? Esau, right? Who was the firstborn, by the way? Esau. When it comes to Jacob, uh, who was the firstborn? Esau. Isaac, Ishmael. I'm sorry, I got those confused. You have Ishmael and you have Isaac. Who was the firstborn? Ishmael. Between Jacob and Esau, firstborn? Esau. Now, why were the others chosen? Why was in Isaac, shall they see, be called? Hmm? The purpose is that he was promised. He was promised. So when you think of Abraham, think the friend of God. When you think of Isaac, I want you to think that he was the promised one. Now, when you think of Jacob, think of the one who wrestled with God for the blessing. Now, who are the Israelites? Because he's saying, I mourn for my brethren who, are, who is Israel. Now he says, and who are the Israelites? They are the friends of God. Remember how the Lord said, you are the children of Abraham. You tried to kill me. This is not what Abraham did. This is not what Abraham did. The sons of Abraham are the friends of God. And what about those that depend upon the law to justify themselves? No. It is the one of promise. God promises. And he is the one that chooses now that really rubs some people the wrong way. But if you're not a friend of God, if God hasn't chosen you, the last one is that you wrestle with God for the blessing. You wrestle with him for the blessing. Those who seek him shall find him. And we can be assured that God is true. And we know this, that if God has saved us, he will save us for sure. But you must also know that it has been promised and that you must seek him with all your heart. You must wrestle for it. But I also know this, that you shall be saved from your sin. Saved from your sin. And once that was done on the cross, the ceremonial law was done. He came and fulfilled that law. No more do we offer sacrifices. No more do we 
uh, observe the things that are ceremonial done, ceremonially done to depict our Lord Jesus Christ. But the law is elevated because now we have a way into the presence of God to enjoy his virtue, to enjoy his presence. Now I want to leave you with this as a closing. I want you to think about your life tomorrow when you wake up that everything that you experience is like a sheet of music that you're going to play. And if you haven't practiced, you won't sound very good. And you may not play it right. And so you need to prepare and practice and you will get better and better. And God will enjoy the way you live your life because this is something that every Christian, they want to know, am I right with God? When all you have to do is enjoy Him. If you enjoy God, you're right. You're right with God because you're resting on the works of Christ and you're walking in the beauty of His holiness. Do not make your Christianity a chore and a task and something that is so heavy that you don't want to do every day. Why would you do that? It sounds to me like it hurts your ears. It's out of tune. What you need to do is to listen or to see the beauty of God. You need to see the beauty of righteousness and justice. Oh my goodness. Pray about this. Seek it out. Have a heart that seeks for the glory, the beauty of God. And you will find that when you practice those scales, every day will be a symphony to the glory of God. He will be well pleased. He will be well pleased. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. You have obeyed my law not because you're offering it to me to stay out of hell, but because you love me. Is that not what we are to do, to love God with all our hearts? Let's go to the Lord in prayer.